my help and salvation. For he who here now to his temple draw near, praise him in glad says trust, but trust is another word for rest. Right? So, Jesus says believers, as believers, we have four responsibilities. Our first responsibility is to sow. You notice that we're supposed to sow. It doesn't say you've got to force people to grow. You can't nag me into growth. We have a responsibility to shine. You know what the word shine means? It means to reflect a bright light to show the brilliance and the excellence of Christ. I was getting coffee this morning, and a lady said, um, well, that's why I don't go to church, because it would fall down. I forget what I said to her to make her say that. But she said, it would, the, the, the building would fall down. And I said, a lot of people say that. You know what I say to them? She goes, what? I say, you puny sinner. You think that God's building is going to fall down because of you and your little puny sin? <laughs> All right, reap. God says one of our four responsibilities is to reap. That means to cut and gather. Sometimes God wants you to pursue another person and sort of encourage them to get right with God. 
I think on Judgment Day, many people are going to say to us, Dude, why did you just let me walk away from fellowship? You should have done something. You should have grabbed me by my collar and shaken me. But we also have the, ability, the, the, we have the responsibility to trust or rest. It's kind of important. You know, we sing the song, Blessed Assurance, and it, it, there's that line in there about resting in the Savior. So our four responsibilities are to sow, to shine, to reap, and to rest. The ability to do that, however, is going to depend on your heart soil. Jesus, the sower, is going to sow something into our heart soils. And there are four types of heart soil. We'll get to that in just a moment. But before I get to that, I want to show you something very, very important in Scripture. Why does Jesus give us parables? The answer may surprise you. If you look at verse 12, what does verse 12 say? In Mark 4, 10 through 12, when he was alone, those around him with the 12, you know Jesus sent out more than just 12 disciples. At one point, he sent out 70 disciples. And when, when we see the Holy Spirit come into the upper room, there's 120 disciples in that upper room. But listen to what he says to those around him with the 12, who may be, there may be, may be that 70, it may be 72, it may be 120, we don't know. But this is what Jesus says to them. In, in, in verse 10, they ask him about, why are you speaking in parables? And look at what he says. In verse 11, to you has been given the secret, and King James says the mystery of the kingdom of God. But everybody else, they're going to get it in parables. Do you get the significance of that? You know what? Remember a few weeks ago we read in Mark where the, uh, the, 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 the Herodians and the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, so they were Sadducees, and the uh, Pharisees, the politically appointed religious class, they said, Jesus, you're casting out demons in conjunction, in cahoots with Beelzebub. And Jesus said, you can say anything negative about me that you want. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and it's all over for you. And this is what the Word literally says. Only disciples get to discern them. Do you understand this, the impact of this? Jesus is basically saying, you have crossed the line, and you are going to hell. I am no longer going to speak to you straightforward. Only my disciples will get this background information to be able to understand. They're the only ones that are going to get the context so they can understand the parables. Only disciples get to discern them. Now I'm going to show you why in just a minute. There are four couple different types of people that are pursuing Jesus here. All right? But the rest of these people, look, listen to what God says. I don't want them to perceive. They have crossed the line. Every one of us who has never received Jesus Christ in our lives know that you may not be able to make a deathbed conversion. You don't know the day that the Lord says, you know what, my spirit is no longer going to strive with man. He tells us that in Genesis right after the flood. You don't know the date that the Holy Spirit says, you know what, I am not striving after you any longer. You're done. The Bible says, behold, today, now is the day of salvation. This is pretty dangerous stuff. Now, I'm not one of those, um, I forget what the, term, what, the, what the theology is where, you know, oh, predestined. I'm not one of these predestination guys that says, hey, some people are predestined, some are not. Some that's never going to witness to anybody. Because if you're predestined, you're going to make it in anyway without me. I'm more of the kind that says, ah, we should witness to everybody. All right? So look what Jesus says. You, I don't want you to perceive. I don't want you to understand. I don't want you to turn and repent. That, isn't that the, the Lord of love is saying this to people? He's not only saying it, he's doing it. Those people have crossed the line. And he says, now you're not getting in. I'm going to do everything in my, this is the Lord speaking, I'm going to do everything in my godly power to keep you from turning and repenting. What's the message for us? Get over yourself. Put your face on the floor before God while you have the chance. It says in verses 33 through 34, With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Your heart soil is going to determine your capacity to receive it. 
He did not speak to them without a parable, meaning the public. From this day forward, Jesus no longer talks straightforward in the presence of the public, and especially in the, in the presence of the scribes and the Pharisees. But he only speaks straightforward in a straightforward manner privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. Pretty interesting, huh? Pretty harsh for people who say God is a God of love. And he is a God of love. And he's a God of great patience. All right. Why? What type of people are the outsiders? The Bible says those on the outside. Well, those are the curiosity seekers. Remember when Jesus, uh, we were when 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 uh, Jesus um, healed a leper and he told the leper, "Don't tell anybody." And the leper went and told everybody. And I showed you that map of the great the, of the, of the 120 mile radius that people were now coming to see Christ. He no longer could walk freely to heal the people that that he may have gone to otherwise. And there were a bunch of curiosity seekers, so much so that somebody really had a paralyzed man, they had to break open the roof to get him down to Christ. Curiosity seekers, casual observers versus those who really are seeking Christ as the Messiah. There are those who are indifferent to Christ, blocking the way for other people to get into that house who couldn't see him. And then there are the fault finders. I believe Jesus Christ began speaking in parables because he says, you know what, you fault finders, you've had it. You're not going to be able to turn and repent. And again, I have to reiterate, in verse 34, he says, he did not speak to them without a parable. They had crossed the line. Remember, Jesus was healing a man in the temple, and they were all looking at him to say, hmm, I wonder if he's going to do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus looked around at them angrily, and he healed that man. He said, it's God's will. is it God's will to do wrong on the Sabbath or to help somebody on the Sabbath? Well, let's talk about these four types of heart soils. Heart soil number one is packed hard by the world's traffic. If you, if, if those of you who live out in the country, you, you walk on a path and you walk on it long enough, long enough and the path gets very hard. It gets, it's, it's hard because of the world's traffic. Traffic is a biblical term for messages or signals that are transmitted through various forms of communication. He sowed some seed along the path. The path is a place of worldly path, path of traffic, hard path, difficult to penetrate. Not to mention that your feet are always destroying the word, the seed that's planted. Man's feet is always destroying it. Man's ideas, man's concepts. These are strong spiritual strongholds, psychological, philosophical strongholds. And guess what comes and eats them? Birds. Remember, in Scripture, birds are rarely a good thing. They usually are emissaries of Satan, metaphorically in Scripture. They, birds are those, those ideas and concepts that traffic through the satanic atmosphere, and they have easy access into the hard-packed heart because the seed is sitting on top of the soil, and they can pick off the Word of God. All right, let's talk about heart soil type number two. It's rocky, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. It lacks the soil depth. You know, sometimes people, will, we see people, uh, we only see what's, a, what's, what's on the surface. Sometimes we want to judge a book by its cover, but the Lord says there are roots inside of people. And my word needs to go down into the root. And when they're on rocky soil, the plant, the roots can't go down, so the plant grows up quickly, but it doesn't develop. It doesn't develop the root system that can get down far enough to get the sustenance, the nurturing that it needs to grow. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Now, we see those people who come to Christ, and they're so excited, right? They're so excited about the things of God. And then they seem to disappear just as quickly as they were excited. The heart soil is rocky. And when you get to know those people, you realize they're struggling with a lot of things. And we have to pray for them. Pray that the Lord... We pray this all the time, right? God, soften my heart so your word can work in me. And we pray that about other people all the time. Lord, soften their heart, Father. Make that heart soil soft so that so your seed can go in and they can develop some roots a root system and get sustenance from you now the third heart soil is thorny and it chokes the word of god in your life 
Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked it, and it yields no grain. Now, thorns are irritating distractions, painful pricks from disobedience, and dangerous neglect that chokes the word of God in our lives. Distractions. You know, thorns are obstacles. They're a source of discomfort, making them difficult to deal with. It makes it difficult to negotiate a thorny place. The seed of God's word cannot grow in thorny hearts of people who hold on to things like unforgiveness. That's a thorn in your, in your, in your system. You know what another thorn in our system is? The butts. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to the radio station and record five radio shows. And um, my first one is going to be about kicking butts. <laughs> really, it's about what's your identity. If I quote the word of God to you and you say, yeah, but social justice. Yeah, but black lives matter. Yeah, but whatever your cause is, but sustainability. If I quote a Bible verse to you and you want to refute me, you should be using another Bible verse. Otherwise, your butt, your cause has become an idol that is a thorn that is choking the word of God in your life. That's why we need to kick butts. And we have, isn't that what people say to us all the time? Yeah, but. Uh -huh. and, they, and they quote something from their idol cause to which they have wrapped their identity around. And rather than say, oh, oh, I'm going to read the scripture tomorrow. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And everybody goes, yes, that's me. I want to quote a scripture to you. You got a butt. The fourth type of soil is good. Good soil yields. A yield is produced by transactions or activities that generate a return on the investment. And that's where you get the yield of 30 60 and 100 fold. Some people will allow the investment that God is making in them to bear interest. They'll, they'll walk with God. They'll let God lead them through the transactions that will produce fruit in the lives of other people. So, our first responsibility is to sow. Four types of heart soils, four types of responses, four types of outcomes. Our second responsibility is to shine. Now, Jesus said a lamp is set on a stand, and it's put there so it uncovers or reveals some things which were once hidden or secret, but they're not secret any longer. The God of the universe explains all these things in his Bible. We just have to read enough of it to make the connections, to get the context of what's actually happening in our, in our world. Now, uh, Jesus said, let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What determines the quality of hearing? It's the, it's the state of the heart. It's the quality of the heart soil. The quality of the heart soil determines the quality of the hearing. The condition of the heart determines the quality of hearing. Your ears are just receivers. Metaphorically, ears in scripture refer to the willingness to listen and to pay attention and to receive from God. He says in verse 24, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use. That's why it is so evil what they're doing to our children by only teaching them one side of the story in school. In Islamic countries, they outlaw the Bible. They outlaw all the alternative information. I was in Dubai and this lady from Kuwait, she said to me in class, she goes, you're reading the Bible. He goes, no, all these other people that come before us from around the world and call themselves Christians, they got like political information. That's like what we see on CNN. You are reading the Bible. I said, well, I hope that's a good thing in her eyes. <laughs> Verse 25, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. We saw that in the beginning with the parables, right? Scribes and the Pharisees, are, these are the people that are studying the word of God the most, and Jesus says you're not going to figure it out. You don't humble yourself before. You have to know the, the shepherd before you're going to be able to read the shepherd's book. 
The heart needs surgery before it is fit or prepared to appropriately hear. Left to our own devices, we're not going to hear what God wants to say. I, I'm going to confess something to you. There was a time in my life where I didn't even want to kind of pray because I was afraid God was going to ask me to do something that I didn't want to do. So the heart is deceitful and it's sick. Your, your heart is sick and deceitful, so we do dumb things. If you confess, it all goes away. Trust me. And if you keep trying to blame it on someone else, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So what is God's, what is God's provision for the sickness that's in all of us? Circumcise your heart. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. You know, most people are just reveling in their sickness. You don't realize you're desperately sick until the Holy Spirit is working in you. And then you realize, wow, this is not good. The people that are not living under conviction, those are the people that God's speaking to in parables. And they're not getting the behind the scenes information to interpret the parable. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. <coughs> this means God knows how to order your circumstances so we, you can grow in Christ. Jeremiah 4, 3 through 4, and Hosea 10, 12 through 13 say that God's remedy is to break up the fallow ground. You know what you do when you break up the fallow ground? You prepare the ground for planting good seed. You prepare the heart for God's word. Once growth starts, God prunes by circumcising your heart. If he did it all at once, we'd all, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to handle it. So the Lord grows us at his own pace. Now, God's got a place at which he wants your plant to grow. You can slow that down, but you can't speed it up. Jer Hosea 10, 12 through 13 says this, Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed iniquity. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way. But you don't have to keep walking there. Jesus gives us this last parable about reaping. He says the kingdom of God grows to activity that involves sowing, sleeping, sprouting, and sickling. Remember, we read that scripture, right? The guy sows and he goes to sleep and he doesn't know what's happening. The earth does it. The God does the growth. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9, one may plant and another may water, but God gives the growth. We don't have to walk around with a Christian notch on our belt saying, oh, this person received Christ, that person received Christ. Oh, I'm so great. I mean, I'm trying to share the Christ with everybody. God will, God will, God will produce the growth. So he, fi he finalizes this with a parable of the mustard seed. Now, the parable of the mustard seed is this. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can nest in its shade. The birds in this sense are probably referring to people who are in the kingdom of God. Christ is represented as the sower and the kingdom is like a tree, a, a tree that's planted for our spiritual good and growth. And, you know how the Bible says we get protection under the shadow of his wings? Well, the kind of, he's using a branch analogy this time. We can get comfort, we can find rest in the shadow of those branches, in the shade and the protection of those branches. So, though the work of God may start out small, the Bible tells us not to despise the day of small things, if it's genuine Christianity, truth as Jesus gives it, it may start out like a grain of mustard seed, but it's going to grow into something that can yield 30, 60, and even 100 fold. I'm going to close with this. We're supposed to be resting in Christ. And how's your rester? Are you full of anxiety and, and I've got to be doing something, I've got to be doing something, instead of resting in the Lord? Now, resting in the Lord is not a cop-out. Resting in the Lord doesn't mean that you get on your spiritual hammock and you never take a risk, you never step out. Resting is allowing God to lead us into unknown territory and trusting him for our well-being and for the results.
We first trusted Christ for salvation, right? Now, now get this. Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. Why won't we trust him with the process of growing us? We're trusting him to save us. And do you think he's wasting, he wasted his time to die for us on the cross and that he now is going to abandon us, something he wants us to do or something he wants us to obey him in? We can participate in these tremendously satisfying experiences of obedience. Obedience is a tremendously satisfying experience where Christ works through us and we experience a blissful communication that relaxes and refreshes our souls. Because when we are relying upon God, we know when to say yes, when to say no. We don't get overburdened and burned out. And get this, how can you prove you're really resting in the Lord? It's through your obedience. That's how you really prove you're trusting and resting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one, the risen Son of God. Hallelujah. God, to know what you would have us know about you and who we are in relationship to you. God, indeed, as we hear the parable of the soil, Lord, we, I pray that each and every one here has that good soil, that good heart, God, where you can indeed invest in each and every one of us, God, that we can grow so that we can know, God, your ways and walk in your ways and testify of you, Jesus, Son, Father, God, indeed. Lord, we know that the natural man, <clears throat> God, he lacks the sixth sense, God, that you've given us by faith, by hearing of your word. Indeed, the preaching of the gospel to him is foolishness. He is spiritually discerned. So, Lord, I pray here that we be not of that nature. We be not of the natural man. But, God, grow us. God, be our portion so that we know you, and not just know you, God, but that we love you. For how much is your love for us? Each and every day, God, we wake up with the privilege, God, with the hope and with the victory of knowing what you did at Calvary's cross. The victory's in you. So, Lord, we thank you indeed. God, indeed, as has been said, all around us, God, we see darkness, we see ugliness, we see the fruit, God, of unrighteousness. And, God, we know that you have placed us here, and we are still here. You don't take us up when we confess you as Lord and Savior, but you leave us here for a purpose to be your ambassadors, to reach that dying world out there. God, to bring them into the light, for once was I, and I thank you indeed for those who witnessed to me as well. So Father, as we close, I just thank you for your blessing.